The FTX scandal with Sam Bankman Freed and Alameda Research is the worst thing to happen to crypto possibly ever. Billions of dollars lost, massive amounts of fraud, and a potential sex cult makes this one of the most insane events to ever happen that is being covered across the globe. There are a million different parts to this, and it seems like this story is being updated almost hourly. Mr. Adam Cochran, professor, marketing strategist, and managing partner at his venture firm, detailed perhaps the most comprehensive thread on this topic. He says that this was a crime, plain and simple. This video is going to tell you everything you need to know about the FTX case according to Adam's super long thread. Adam first started seeing some really weird things happening on FTX all the way back in September when he noticed that every other exchange had declining open interest for Ethereum while FTX open interest for Ethereum was at all time highs and basically open interest is how many futures contracts are being bought and sold and it's really really weird that FTX would have super super high open interest while every other exchange was declining in open interest. Well, it turns out that Alameda Research, which was Sam Bankman Fried's hedge fund that was being run by his girlfriend Caroline, more on that later, had a huge long position on Ethereum on FTX, and they continued to buy it, making sure that the Ethereum price would stay above $1,200. As Ethereum continued to drop in price, Alameda Research was having a lot of trouble keeping Ethereum above its liquidation price. So Sam Bankman Freed started giving Caroline and Alameda Research billions of dollars. The only problem was that it wasn't his money to begin with. The money that Sam was giving Caroline for Alameda Research was actually the user's funds of FTX that users were putting their hard-earned money into FTX in order to trade and invest. Sam was stealing that and giving it to Caroline and Alameda Research. Now we need to take a little detour into one of the most heinous acts in this whole charade. We all know that Celsius, BlockFi, and other lenders let you take out loans using your crypto as collateral. Well, SBF, Caroline, Alameda, and FTX, they were taking out large loans using cryptocurrencies that they created such as FTT, SRM, and others as collateral. They then sell the tokens that they borrowed and they borrowed so much that this would distress the entire markets and it would also distress the very lenders that they borrowed from. Then they turned around and said, hey, no, we're going to buy the lenders out. And I'm gonna have to make another video just on this topic because it was actually even worse than how I'm explaining it right now. But summed up, FTX and Alameda were the people who actually made tokens like FTT. So they controlled most of it. So it had a very low circulating supply. Adam had an analogy that he put in his Twitter thread saying, okay, imagine that you sold one strand of hair for $100 and then said, well, this strand of hair was worth $100, so all of the rest of the hair on my body is worth a trillion dollars in collateral. FTX and Alameda gave away some FTT and said that they have so much that it's worth billions upon billions of dollars in collateral. And so they borrowed billions upon billions of dollars based off of the perceived value of FTT, which is fine if FTT goes up, but if FTT goes down, that's trouble. Now we need to take one more small detour into some of the most atrocious behavior by SBF. In early October, Sam was lobbying Congress to get a bill passed called the Digital Commodities Consumer Protection Act. And this bill would effectively completely ban DeFi and ban decentralization and basically just destroy what the freaking ethos of crypto is all about. Why was he doing this? It's because if DeFi gets shut down, then people will be forced to put money into centralized exchanges like FTX. This falls right in line with SBF being the crypto spokesperson for the World Economic Forum, which wants a centralized digital currency to have control over everybody on earth. And we'll get more into that conspiracy in another video. We also learned that Alameda invested into hundreds of different projects in the crypto space and said that in order for us to invest, you guys have to hold the majority of your funds on FTX, AKA more money gets funneled into FTX. Then on October 19th, 
lawyer, Gabriel Shapiro, was able to get a copy of the DCCAP bill that was floating around Washington. The crypto community, seeing that this bill would outright ban DeFi, became enraged with Sam after they saw that Sam was really trying hard to push this. This is when Sam started getting totally erratic, defensive, and just bashing out against everyone. This is also when Sam made his now infamous jab at the Binance CEO, CZ, basically saying, oh, you're allowed to go to DC, right? Sam continued to blame CZ over the next coming weeks for FTX's collapse. This was a far cry from his altruistic nice guy persona that he put on all of these years. Then on November 2nd, Coindesk published an overview of Alameda's assets, which suggested that Alameda could be insolvent. Sam completely ignored these allegations and instead started tweeting for everyone to buy FTT, hoping that suckers would buy his token before he just completely stole it all. And it was at this time that we learned that Alameda had $8 billion worth of loans that were backed up using mostly the FTT token. Now, no sophisticated lending desk or really any desk that's worth its salt would give out a loan of $8 billion using FTT as collateral. No one would do that, except for maybe Sam Bankman fried at FTX. And this is where people started to get really alarmed because unlike a bank, Crypto exchanges aren't allowed to just take your money and lend it out and do whatever they want with it unless it's, of course, in a lending product or you sign some terms of conditions or something like that. And if you read the FTX terms of services, it literally says none of the digital assets in your account are the property of or shall be loaned to FTX trading. FTX trading does not represent or treat digital assets in users accounts as belonging to FTX trading. You control the digital assets held in your account. This means that if they use your digital assets for any purpose other than what you allow them to, that is legally theft. Well, remember that Alameda had $8 billion worth of loans outstanding. And unless you actually sign an agreement on FTX exchange saying that you're using their lending program, then your money is supposed to be yours. Well, FTX had about $2.8 billion in their lending program, but Alameda had $8 billion in, in loans outstanding. So where's the difference coming from? Where's that gap? Where's all of that money? Well, that difference in the money between what FTX had and the actual loans that Alameda Research took out could only come from two different places. Number one, FTX had a cold storage that no one really knew about, or it was coming from users' funds. Well, remember that Alameda and FTX had a lot of that FTT token, and that was the main token that they were using as collateral. Well, they were trying to sell as much as they could over the counter in order to fill that hole. Well, it didn't take long for other people to notice that FTX and Alameda were actually selling as much FTT as humanly possible in order to fill that $8 billion loan that they took out. And eventually CZ, who is the owner of the number one exchange in the world, Binance, he noticed this. And CZ actually had over half a billion dollars worth of FTT. So when he saw that Alameda and SBF and FTX were selling as much FTT as possible, he said, screw this, I'm not gonna hold any more of it. And so CZ came out with this tweet saying, yeah, I'm gonna sell and liquidate all of my FTT. And that's when Caroline, Sam Bankman frieds girlfriend who runs Alameda Research came out and said, hey, we'll happily buy all of your FTP from you at $22. After this tweet, everyone knew that if the price of FTT fell below $22, things would get real messy real quick. And people did not think that $22 was going to actually hold. So people started to withdraw their money from FTX. And as more people withdrew from FTX, FTX started pulling their stable coins from everywhere in order to refill their wallets. You could tell that people were starting to get a little concerned or really concerned around this time. And so this is when SBF came out and said, FTX is fine. Assets are fine. He also came out and said, FTX has enough to cover all client holdings and we do not invest client assets. 
even in treasuries. We have been processing all withdrawals and we will continue to process withdrawals. This was a flat out lie as FTX did not have enough to cover all asset holdings. FTX was not fine and assets were not fine. And as their stable coin wallets were getting lower and lower from everyone withdrawing their funds, so were their ETH wallets. Then people started saying, well, dang, if their stable coin wallets and their ETH wallets are getting that low, maybe they don't have anything. And that is when the true bank run actually started. Trying to calm the panic, Caroline tweeted that Alameda actually had over $10 billion worth of assets that were not reflected on the recently leaked balance sheet. However, the exchange's wallets continued to get lower and lower. So while some people waited for this refill from this magical $10 billion worth of assets, others still withdrew their funds. The bank run continued. This is when Adam Cochran posted a chart where he tracked every single wallet that FTX and Alameda had with transactions going back years. And he found no secret cold wallets with any money in them, like Caroline said. In other words, Caroline lied. On November 7th, the price of Solana, which is one of Alameda's biggest holdings, began to drop. They were obviously selling as much Solana as possible in order to prop up the price of FTT and keep it above $22. Then out of nowhere, you could see that the price was stable, 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 and boom, it dropped. Turns out that this tweet where Caroline said that they would happily buy the half a billion dollars of FTT that CZ was going to sell at $22. Yeah, that was also a lie because it just dumped right below 22 bucks. So they clearly did not have the money. So how can an exchange that claimed to have over $10 billion worth of assets not be able to afford $550 million worth of their own token? This was when the broader market started to get really concerned because it was clear that something was really, really wrong. And we, we had no idea just how wrong and how bad things actually were. And on the night of November 7th, FTX started to stop withdrawals of particular assets. A lot of users' balances were entirely stuck. We now know that SBF was trying to raise between six and $10 billion worth of liquidity around this time. Within a day, SBF came out with a wild tweet and turn of events saying that things have come full circle and FTX.com's first and last investors are the same. We have come to an agreement on a strategic transaction with Binance and apparently Binance was planning on buying them out. This was really weird because literally the other day, Sam and FTX came out saying that the assets are fine and that the exchange is fine. And now they're doing a complete buyout? Well, soon enough, it did come to light that they had a hole of five to $10 billion. And not even 24 hours later, Binance and CZ pulled out of the deal saying that there was massive misuse of users' funds and there was way too much trouble when it came to regulation and all these other things. So they wanted nothing to do with it. CZ said that FTX was so far gone that it was beyond our ability to help. That's really bad. And that was also the first true inkling that something really illegal was going on. A few days later, the allegations that there was some shady illegal activity going on with FTX came to light when news broke out that SBF created a bespoke back door to steal users' funds, give them to Alameda, and outwit the compliance systems such as FTX's compliance audits. Meanwhile, during the silence, Alameda continued to make really bizarre trades, such as shorting USDT, knowing that the funds would be clawed back if there was bankruptcy proceedings. And while this was going on, Sam was basically silent. Eventually though, Sam came out of the silence only to lie again, saying that he was putting together funding and had commitments from people. That was all BS. And we know that that's BS because the very next day, Sam came out saying that FTX, FTX US, and Alameda all were filing for bankruptcy. SBF said that this didn't necessarily mean the end of Alameda and that he was shocked to find out what happened, despite the fact that we know that he built a back door specifically in order to commit fraud. In fact, according to an FTX insider that talked with Adam, Sam wasn't really talking to anybody. He was out on his own. Over the next few days, Sam worked really hard to get friendly media pieces to write good stories about him. 
He really tried to frame it that this was a story of a company that grew too big too fast and that he made a mistake and that this was just an accounting error or something that happened because of the actions of the competitor, aka CZ and Binance. He was even saying stuff how he's an honest and humble person. Get out of here. In this New York Times article, they only mentioned the fact that SBF and Caroline may have stolen users' funds in one sentence, and basically the rest of the article painted Sam as some super genius guy who just bit off more than he could chew. Look at this headline from Forbes magazine. Queen Caroline, the risk-loving 29-year-old embroiled in the FTX collapse, this girl stole billions of dollars of hard-working people's funds and literally degenerately gambled it and lost it. She wasn't embroiled in the FTX collapse. She freaking caused it. My theory, given the fact that Caroline was the head of Alameda Research and was in control of whatever Alameda did, was that Caroline took out way too many loans, got way too over her head, didn't use stop losses, and ended up making so many bad mistakes that it would have put Alameda under. So she came to her boyfriend Sam and begged him to take users' funds so that she wouldn't go under. Remember, these two were freaking lovers. This was some Bonnie and Clyde stuff over here, okay? And let's not forget that there was at least eight other people that were all romantically involved having parties in their big ass mansion in the Bahamas. That is a video all in of itself. Now, between this Forbes article and the New York Times article I just showed you, this should really, really make you question mainstream media. Remember that by the time this and the New York Times posts were actually written, we already knew that SBF and Caroline and at least two other people from FTX knew that they were going against the user's terms and conditions and stealing people's funds to cover a very risky position that was over leveraged that they put on. We already know this, and yet Forbes and the New York Times are posting these people as mistake kids, like kids that made a mistake. What Alameda Research should have done, what would have been the ethical thing to do, was to simply sell their positions, take the L, salvage whatever they had left, and freaking trade it back up to a good position. They had all of the freaking information from everyone on the exchange. They knew where people's stop losses were anyway, so they could have freaking easily made it all back. But instead, they stole users' funds from hardworking people that were tricked into putting their money into what they thought was a regulated exchange in the U.S. for FTX U.S. The New York Times also interviewed the coach at the FTX house in the Bahamas who basically said that, oh, SBF is a really humble guy and he doesn't like to spend much. Yeah, except for the hundreds of millions of dollars that he spends on these huge resorts in the Bahamas from putting their faces up on billboards, buying hundreds of millions of dollars worth of luxury apartments and having a 24 hour kitchen staff. Yeah, they were anything but frugal. But that didn't stop this media campaign who really wanted to paint SBF as a good kid who fumbled the bag because he grew a business way too fast and he just couldn't control it. Rather than a freaking thief who steals people's funds and then uses it to help an over leveraged bet that took on way too much risk. Now, backing away from my soapbox and going back to the story, it turns out that on November 11th, a lot of users' funds were being drained to basically zero and a lot of money was taken from the FTX exchange and put into different wallets that no one really knew what they were. It turns out that they might have been the government of the Bahamas wallets, actually. That part of the story is still unfolding. And then this started happening. Over the next few days, Sam tweeted out letter by letter the word happened, showing really no remorse for his actions and pretty much playing a game. He eventually wrote out a lot more and also had an interview via DMs with Vox where he basically said that his whole philanthropist stuff was all just a PR stunt and it was all a farce. 
He also said that as to the best of his knowledge, as of post November 7th, the potential for errors were not really that much and that Alameda actually had more assets than liabilities. Turns out that that was also BS because Adam over here looked at the blockchain, which is really, really good at, I don't know, recording transactions. And he saw that FTX had at most $3 billion when remember Alameda had an $8 billion hole. So yeah, that whole tweet by SBF was total nonsense. Oh yeah, and remember how SBF said that assets were fine and FTX was fine a while back? Yeah, Adam looked and saw that on November 3rd and 4th, days before he suggested they were still fine. Like, it, it, you could see that they were not. And here's a crazy freaking twist of this story. While all this was happening, as I mentioned before, he was doing interviews via DMs. He did an interview via DM with Vox, where, like I said, he said that his whole altruistic, like, not the vegan part, but the altruistic philanthropist stuff where he wants to give away all his money. He said that was all PR. That was all BS. That was just publicity to try to make him look like a really good guy and a good public image. He literally says that this is a dumb game that we woke Westerners play where we say all the right things and so everyone likes us. By the way, he's not wrong on this. That's what cancel culture created. Instead of just being blunt and having an open free dialogue, you have to be extremely careful with everything that you say because some people will take it out of context or maybe just take a little clip out of a big thing that you say and then push it out and you will get berated and harassed and you'll get canceled or you'll just have all of this negativity thrown at you constantly by people who refuse to see or even hear any other point of view. Also note that during the Vox interview, Sam literally confesses to stealing users' funds because, quote unquote, sometimes life creeps up on you. This should be enough to put him in jail. Yet, for some reason, as of recording this video, he's still roaming free. We'll get into the conspiracies behind that in another video. So now SBF says that he has one goal which will determine the rest of his life, and that is to raise $8 billion in the next two weeks. He said that there are people who rose, fell, and then rose again who might be willing to help. As Adam Cochran wrote in this insanely long Twitter thread, Sam Bankman fried doesn't care about users. He flat out said that this isn't so black and white. SBF doesn't care that he stole funds from people who trusted him, and he doesn't care that he even stole in the first place. To Sam, this is some sort of perverse maximalist utilitarianism where his actions are justified by the fact that he was gambling big and that others did similar things. He'll just tell you out loud that he stole. Meanwhile, hundreds of people are hard at work trying to guide the company through chapter 11 and get as many dollars for the estate as possible to pay back the creditors. In the eyes of SBF, he blames his other founders. It's their fault for caring. In the meantime, SBF is focusing on a media apology tour to keep a clean enough brand to raise $8 billion. Not for you, but for him, so he can do it all again and not go to jail. SBF lied to us, to all of us, to our faces, right up until the bitter end of the exchange. He tweeted lies and platitudes and continued to change his story. He slings arrows at rivals and co-founders, blaming them for his downfall and I'm sure that he will seek to discredit his critics and continue to build a pristine image of himself along with the media to continue to quietly raise, or not so quietly raise, that $8 billion. We literally cannot believe a single word that comes out of this guy's mouth. The scope of this illusion of fraud is so big, it makes P.T. Barnum, who's the guy that's credited with the adage, there's a sucker born every minute, look like an honest and ethical stockbroker. This is a man who lied to us, viewed it all as a game, thought of us as pieces on a chessboard, and continues to play the game, thinking he is above the ethics and the law. Make no mistake, this wasn't the actions of a caring altruist who messed up. This was theft and fraud with bankruptcy that will scar this sector for a generation to come. And I truly believe that as well. It's going to take a long time for this to blow over and for us to recover from this. And in the end, though, decentralization and transparency, that is what matters. And that's what this industry is fighting for. That's why this industry was born. It was born out of the 2008 financial crisis because there were so many things happening on the back end that we didn't know. And that's exactly what happened with SBF and FTX and Alameda and all of this 
BS that just happened right now. It's the same thing that happened in the traditional financing system. And that's crypto was made to get away from that. So let's get back to the ethos of what crypto is truly about.